Okay, I got confirmation that we are live. Hi everybody, welcome back. My name is Miss Calloway and I'm here to once again teach a class for ages 11 to 14. So I am going to be focusing on some geography skills today and teaching you uh, some vocabulary that you can use when it comes to giving yourself directions because of course it's always important to be able to tell people where you are and to know where you are yourself. So what do you say? We jump into that. So the first thing we're going to do is say excuse me, got a little allergy here. Don't worry, it's not Corona. <laughs> I am first going to teach you guys about something called prepositions. So prepositions are words that allow you to specifically name a location in your sentence. For example, if I say, I am going to the store, well, which word in that sentence is a preposition? The word to. I am going to the store. So we're going to look at some other prepositions and help you identify a bunch of new ones, hopefully, or review some that you already know. So if you guys are ready, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see what I see. Okay, one moment here. Okay. So these are some prepositions. Now, the most basic preposition that we have is the word on. And it's antonym. Remember, we learned about synonyms and antonyms in my previous lesson with you. It means the opposite meaning word. Its antonym is the word in. So, in the first picture that you can see here, the apple is on the box. And in the second picture, the apple is in the box. So on and in are both prepositions. It's a long word, but it has a pretty simple meaning. And then we have another couple of prepositions. Actually, I'm gonna skip down here and let you see these two. Above, below. So the football is above the box, but the basketball is below the shelf. They are opposites, above, below. And even though these two words are antonyms, they do have synonyms. A synonym for the word above would be over. You could also say that the ball is over, excuse me, the football is over the box. And you could say that the basketball is under the shelf. Over, under, above, below. And you can get another picture of under right here. The dog is under the table, but the table is over the dock. So both things are true. And then you can see this shy little guy. He's hiding behind a tree. Doesn't want to come out and say hello to us. That little guy in the purple hat is behind the tree. The tree is in front of him. And then down here, we have the opposite, in front of. The elephant is in front of the chair, but the chair is behind the elephant. 
So those two things are opposites. Behind, in front of, over, under, above, below, and of course, on, in. Going on down, we have between. This one is one of my favorites. The apple is between the two boxes. In order for something to be between, it needs to have things on both sides of it. Okay? Then we have this rabbit who is inside a hat. And you might be thinking, well, what's the difference between in and inside? Actually, there is no real difference. Inside and in mean the same thing. They're synonyms. Just like the word out, which is the opposite of in, I'm sure you remember, is the synonym of outside. So, inside, outside. This wolf is outside the door. Ooh, don't open it. Let's make sure he stays outside. But this rabbit is inside the hat. You could just as easily say the rabbit is in the hat. Same meaning. But you couldn't say the wolf is out the door. So out and outside are actually a little bit different. Maybe I should explain that. Hmm. That could be confusing. So when something is outside, it means that it's completely removed from the area. And you can use the word outside by itself. For example, your mom could say, go play outside. If your mom said, go play out, you might say, out where, mom? So outside stands alone as its own word, whereas out sometimes needs another word to clarify. I hope that makes sense. So, not exactly the same as out, now that I thought about it. Here are another pair of opposing synonyms, excuse me, opposing prepositions. They are antonyms, not synonyms. Up and down. In one picture, the dog goes up the stairs, and in another picture, the dog goes down the stairs. So, maybe they should have been reversed, that the dog went down the stairs to get the newspaper and then came back up with the newspaper. Oh well, up and down are still opposites, just like down and up. And then we have this one, into. Now this one is a little bit tricky. It's not the same as in, in every situation. It could be in some situations. For example, in this picture, you see that there is milk in the glass, in. But we use the word into when we want to describe an action. So what we're looking at in this picture is somebody pouring the milk into the glass. It would be okay to say, pour the milk in the glass. But when we choose to use the word into, we are emphasizing the action. For example, when it's time for you to go to school on a normal day, not like today, maybe you go by car. And your mom or dad could say, please get into the car. But if you're already in the car, sitting and waiting to go, then nobody will use the word into we wouldn't say you are sitting into the car. We would just say in. You are sitting in the car. So into always goes along with action. Get into your seat, your teacher at school might have said when you were going to school. Or get into the car. Or at night, please get into your bed. And then you will be in your bed. And then you'll be ready to sleep. 
Let's take a look at the next one. Towards. When you move towards something, it means you are moving closer and closer to that object. And when something moves towards you, it's moving closer and closer to you. So towards, as you can see, has this S inside these two curving lines called parentheses. That's because it doesn't always have to be used. You could say for this picture, for example, the ball is moving toward the flag, or you could say the ball is moving towards the flag, and both would be exactly correct. So English can be a little bit funny sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you can choose your own English. Look at this cute little rabbit. He's going around the tree. When you go around, you're making a curved motion that is all or part of a circle. Next to. Something being next to you doesn't mean the same thing as in front of you or behind you. It has to be on your side. Okay? It's next to you. Opposite. Now, this one is a peculiarly British word. By that, I mean that Americans don't use this word in the same way. When a British person or someone from Australia, for example, uses the word opposite, an American would say across from. So in this picture, an American would say, these two people are sitting across from each other. But a British person would say, these two people are sitting opposite each other. Of course, they would say it in a British accent, but I'm not going to torture you by making you listen to mine. So that's just something to keep in mind, that some of these words are a little bit different depending on which country you're talking about. Speaking of across, here is another cute little bunny, and he's standing there. Looks like he's ready to go across the street, but he's waiting. He's a smart bunny. He's waiting for his mom because, of course, he knows that you shouldn't cross the street by yourself. So this bunny knows exactly what to do. Wait for a grown-up. And then, when the grown-up arrives, they will go across the street. Here's another bunny sitting by a red cube. Now, if something is by you, then you can consider it to be close to you. It doesn't matter if it's in front of you or behind you or next to you or next to you on your other side. It simply means that it's somewhere nearby. So, by is a pretty flexible word. And finally, through. Through. When you pass one object, in the middle of another object, then it's going through. So with that in mind, how about meeting my little friend, the koala? And practicing some of these prepositions together. So, first of all, the koala is on my hand. On. Good day, mate. <laughs> now he's in my hand. In. Now the koala is under this hand. He's still in this hand, but he's under this hand. Now he's over this hand. 
now the koala is behind this hand. In front of this hand. Now the koala is between my hands. Don't worry, I'm not hurting him. Could the koala go inside my hands? No, I don't think so. Koala goes up. Koala goes down. I should really come up with a name for this guy, huh? Koala is above my hand. Koala is below my hand. I am dropping the koala into my hand. Oh, no, I dropped him. <laughs> One more time, dropping him into my hand. You tricky little koala. <laughs> Don't worry, he's fine. We won't do it again. The koala is moving towards me. Hello. Now the koala is moving around me. The koala is next to my head. The koala is opposite me. And he is Australian, so he would say opposite. I would say you are across from me. What? No, don't argue with me. I'm the teacher. The koala is by me, on my shoulder. And now the koala is through <laughs> with this demonstration. That's actually a different meaning of the word through. My little joke. Okay, so now that you know some prepositions, we can go ahead and practice some other types of directional words. So, I want to teach you guys some direction words that are connected to maps. Okay, so this is where the geography comes in. Anytime that you look at a map, you have to be able to tell where you are and where you are going. So we're going to learn some key words about directions. Whoopsie. There we go. All right. So take a look at this. We have four key words to think about. North, south, east, and west. These are what are known as the cardinal directions. So you have to know these words to be able to give people good directions and to be able to follow good directions yourself. These are compasses. Some people also call it the compass rose. And you'll notice the letters on it. N for north, E for east, S for south, and W for West, because those match up with the compass directions. So let's take a look at this compass, which is a little bit more fun. Once again, we have N for North, E for East, S for South, and W for West. But what are these little letters in between? Well, those are what are called ordinal directions. Because sometimes when you're moving, you're not moving in exactly in a straight line. You have to move in different directions. So if you're moving slightly up, but also slightly this way, then we call that northeast. And if you're moving slightly south, but also slightly this way, we call it southeast, plus southwest, and northwest. And notice that north and south always come first. We would never say west-north or east-south. And notice that north and south are once again 
antonyms. They are the opposite of each other. So you cannot be going north-south or south-north because it's not possible for your body to go in two totally opposite directions at the same time. So this compass matches up a little bit with our actual world. To the north, we have polar bears. And I'll show you guys here on the map. Up here in the Arctic, that's where the polar bears are from. Ooh, this is getting really big. Um, yeah. There it is. So, way up here in the Arctic is where polar bears live in some of these cold island countries like Greenland. You can find polar bears. And of course, they're great swimmers and they have thick fur so they can swim around in that cold Arctic Ocean water. And then to the south on our globe, we have the continent Antarctica. You guys see that one down here? So down here on Antarctica is where the penguins are from. All different kinds of penguins. And to the east, on this half of the globe, we have Africa, Asia, two continents where elephants live. African elephants are the ones with the bigger ears. And then, of course, there are Asian elephants. And then to the west, well, <laughs> there are lots of different animals over here, but I guess bunny rabbits are one of them. So you can sort of see how the animals match up with our world map. So let's take a look at this world map. How are you guys with your geography skills? Are you any good? Actually, before we do that, maybe we should review the continents and the oceans. What do you think? Now, there are many different ways to teach continents and oceans. And in some countries, they might do it a little bit differently than what I'm about to teach you. So always be sure to check with your own classroom teacher, okay? But in the meantime, you guys can learn that there are seven continents and five oceans. And again, there are a lot of different ways to divide those up. Some people say there are really only three continents. Well, it's up to your method. But I was taught seven, and seven matches up with my flashcards. So we're going with seven today. So first of all, the continent of Antarctica. That's the one all the way down south. And it's super cold. But there are still a lot of cool animals that live way down here, oops, way down here at the bottom. Now, on the map I showed you, Antarctica looked like a long straight line. But remember that it's a flat map. Our real world is a round ball called a sphere. So when the world is round, it's easy to see that Antarctica actually looks like this, its own little continent. But on a flat map, it's hard to show that. So here are some of the animals that you can find in Antarctica. Like I said, they got penguins. One type of penguin they have is the emperor penguin. They also have the elephant seal. And as you notice, that elephant seal has some pretty thick skin because it is so cold down in Antarctica. That guy needs some serious protection. So, the elephant seal. They also have birds down there. You wouldn't think birds would like such cold weather, but they do. So the Antarctic tern is one of them. And of course, more penguins. 
the king penguin. Another continent is Africa. And to get from Antarctica to Africa, you have to go north, where you will find gorillas, lions, rhinos, and baboons, among other things. There are tons of different animals there, too. Then, if you're in Africa, and you keep heading north, you will get to Europe where you will find animals like the wolf, dogs like the German Shepherd from Germany, and the Bulldog, and of course, reindeer. Once you're in Europe, you could head east to Asia, which is where I am right now. In Asia, you have water buffalo. We have tons of these in Vietnam, the country that I'm currently living in. Tigers. Oops. Cranes. And yaks. Then, from Asia, if you head southeast, you will find yourself in Australia. Australia is also a continent, but it's almost like an island. In fact, it kind of is an island, just a huge, huge island. And because it's an island isolated by itself for so many years, it developed a lot of very unique animals, like the dingo and the koala, the platypus, and the kangaroo. Of course. From there, if you head directly east and keep going across a whole lot of water, you'll eventually hit the tip of South America, where you'll find a taper, the llama, ant eaters. Ooh, have you ever eaten ants? And the condor. And of course, if you head north from South America, you get to the continent that I grew up on, which is North America, where we have buffalo, not water buffalo like in Asia, slightly different, coyotes, eagles, and bears, grizzly bears, not polar bears. Then, the world could be considered divided up into five different oceans. So continents are giant land masses. The oceans, of course, are giant bodies of water. And there are a lot of other bodies of water. We might have time to go over some of them in this lesson today, like lakes and rivers and streams. But let's focus first on the oceans. Those are the major ones. So, we started off in North America. Sorry, we left off in North America. If you are in North America and you head east, you will find the Atlantic Ocean. It's cold water in the Atlantic Ocean. And fish, of course, sailfish. Ooh, whales, like humpback whale. Flounder, another fish. Remember, whales aren't fish, they're mammals. And the cod. From there, if you continue to the north, and actually it's more like northeast, you'll get to a pretty cold ocean called the Arctic Ocean. That's where you find those walruses, plankton, narwhals, the unicorns of the sea, and beluga whales. And then, if you head south from the Arctic Ocean, 
you hit the Indian Ocean with the Nautilus, a dugong, lionfish, oof, isn't that cool looking? And of course, sea turtles. These are the ones that crawl up on the beach and lay their eggs in the sand. Cute. The Indian Ocean is really warm and tropical, especially compared to the next ocean heading south, the Southern Ocean. The Patagonian toothfish, cheese. Krill, sperm whales, and giant squid, oh my, all call the Southern Ocean home. Finally, head north from the Southern Ocean to the biggest ocean on the planet, the mighty Pacific. This is the ocean I like best because I grew up close to this ocean. So at the Pacific, you can find a giant octopus in the Pacific, I should say. Excuse me, wrong preposition. Tuna. You like tuna fish. Marlin. And the killer whale or orca. So, that's our little geography tour. Now let's see if you can remember those compass directions for a little quiz game. Share my screen again. And let's try it. So, taking a look at, where should we start? Well, how about starting here in Vietnam, since that's where I am right now. So you can see Vietnam here, this yellow shape. Now, from Vietnam, where would you be if you went directly north? North, 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 north. It's China. And from China, what country would you hit if you went directly north again? North, 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 Mongolia. And if you keep going north, Russia. Let's try again. Starting in Vietnam, where would you go if you headed directly south? South, south, well, first you'd hit Malaysia, then Indonesia, and finally you'd just be swimming around in the Indian Ocean until you got down to Antarctica. That would be a pretty long swim. And from Vietnam, if you headed to the east, directly east, you would get into some water here. It's not a big enough body of water to be called an ocean, though. It's usually called a sea, although the name of the sea is disputed. And you would eventually get to the Philippines. Beautiful country. Now, what if you were in Vietnam and you headed to the west? Well, it would actually depend on whether you were in the north part of Vietnam, where I live, or the southern part of Vietnam. From where I live, if you go west, the first country you'd get to would be Laos. But from down here where my friends live in Ho Chi Minh City, the first country would be Cambodia. And then, either way, if you keep heading west, you would hit Thailand. And then you'd either hit a little bit of Myanmar or you'd go for a swim in the Bay of Bengal, like the Bengal Tigers. Oof, pretty cool. So what's the difference between all these different bodies of water? Why are some called seas and others are called bays? And way over here, something is called a gulf. Well, that has to do with the shape of the land around the body of water. A huge, huge open area like this is just called an ocean. And the Pacific Ocean, as you can see, is split into two because, again, this is a flat map, but it's actually really big. So the Atlantic Ocean is an easier one to look at because you can see the whole thing. So you can see that this is a huge open area. That's why it's an ocean. 
A sea is also open, but not as open as an ocean. So a sea is basically like an ocean, but it's just smaller. And then you have a bay. A bay is more enclosed by land. So you can see here that the land is kind of circling all the way around this bay with just a little bit of an exit here and a few smaller exits here and here. So Hudson Bay is even more enclosed. It's a huge body of water, but look how much land is blocking it from being open like a sea. Like this sea is just open everywhere. Or this sea, pretty open. So if it's like a sea, but it's kind of closed off by land, then it's a bay. And if it's like a bay, but it's even smaller, then it's a gulf. So I hope that clears it up for you. But I'll tell you, <clears throat> there are no hard and fast rules. Some gulfs, like this one over here, the Gulf of Alaska, isn't really all that enclosed off. <laughs> so you could say that a gulf is slightly more open than a bay sometimes, but honestly, sometimes these rules are just a little bit loosey-goosey. Like this one. This is called the Red Sea, but look, there's only a little tiny opening here. So why don't they call it a bay? I don't know. I don't make the rules. Oh, by the way, this is where I'm originally from, the United States. And it is between two oceans on its east-west, the Pacific on the west and the North Atlantic on the east. And it's between two countries on its north-south. Canada to the north, we call them our neighbors to the north. I don't even want to think about what they call us these days. And Mexico to the south. So, we have a huge world with a whole lot of different things going on in different directions. And hopefully, you've learned something about how those directions work and how to explain where you are to different people. Now, we do still have some time left, so I think we can go over a few more landforms and bodies of water. So bear with me, and I will pull that up for you guys and share my screen again. So remember, bodies of water can be different. They could be salt water or fresh water, for example. And if it's salt water, that means you can't drink it. If it's fresh water, that means you could drink it if it's clean. Unfortunately, these days, a lot of freshwater lakes and rivers no longer have drinkable water because we've polluted them. But when people use the word fresh to describe a body of water, all they're really saying is that the water is technically drinkable because it doesn't have salt in it. It doesn't mean you should just and drink it. Okay, sorry guys, one moment. Hmm. Well, we're having a little bit of a connection problem, so I'm not able to pull up my other material for you guys. I'm so sorry. So instead, Let's just see if we can make some sentences using some animal pictures. All right, so let's try that instead. Backup plan. Okay, so these are already loaded, so you don't have to worry about the connection. So you can see two animals here. Let's do a little bit of a review game. Do you guys remember which continent I told you these animals come from? Who can remember the continent that the gorilla comes from? Okay, I'm going to give you some hints. It is south of 
of Europe. Can you guys remember that map? Oh, maybe I can show you the map, actually. It's still here. So, here's Europe. Which continent is south of Europe? Why? Africa, of course. So, the gorilla came from Africa. And then, looking at our next animal here, the grizzly bear. Do you guys remember which continent I told you the grizzly bear is from? I'll give you a hint. It was the one that is between two oceans on the east-west and between two continents on the north-south. Anybody remember the name of it? Here's another hint. It's where I'm from. Okay. Give up. Well, here it is. North America. The grizzly bear comes from North America. Let's take a look at some others. <clears throat> hmm. Do you remember from the compass where the rabbit comes from? It was generally in a west direction. Well, it was also North America. And how about this beaver? Well, they have beavers in a lot of places, as a matter of fact. They definitely have some in North America, but they also have beavers in Europe. How about this super tropical bird? A beautiful toucan. Well, toucans are from South America. And remember where I told you those dogs came from? Many species of dogs come from Europe. So, that's the end of our time today. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot about geography and prepositions and direction words. And maybe you even learned a few things about the map and about some countries that are on it. If you liked this lesson, my name is Miss Calloway, and you can find my profile on Verbling. I would be very happy to work with you and your child. I'm an international classroom teacher, and these are the types of lessons that I specialize in that are not just basic English skills, but a little something extra, more simulating an international classroom experience. I'd love to work with you guys, so, Feel free to check out my profile and sign up for some lessons. See you tomorrow.